Hello, valued viewers. I hope you are all doing very well. And before we begin today's story, just a quick reminder that the Super Thanks button is on and is located on the taskbar next to the Like button. And any contribution is greatly appreciated. And also, if you contribute $20 or more, you get your own video topic that takes priority over any other project that I am doing. With that, on with the story. Okay, so the Denver Rio Grande locomotive 3703 was a simple articulated 4664 type company's classification as L-105. It had a tractive effort of 105,000 pounds. It was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in April of 1938. So if you didn't know that Baldwin also built Challenger type locomotives, you do now. Because most normally associate this type of locomotive with Elco. So anyhow, all cylinders were 23 inches in diameter with a 32 inch stroke. The driving wheels were 70 inches in diameter of full tires. Total weight on the driving wheels in working order is 437,939 pounds. And the weight of the locomotive was 641,900 pounds. The rectangular tender with east steel water bottom frame and a capacity of 20,000 gallons of water and 26 tons of coal. And it weighed 394,000 pounds when fully loaded. Some other features with this locomotive is that it had the Baldwin Power Reverse Gear. It also used wall shirt valve gears and also utilized Alesco feed water pump and heaters. So the last annual inspection on the 3703 was made at Salt Lake City, Utah on November 8th of 1951. And the last monthly inspection, a quarterly, was made at Pueblo, Colorado on October 3rd, 1952, at which time the boiler was last washed. So of all the accidents that I've looked at over the past uh, few months and, and over the years I've been reading on steam locomotives, this is the first one that actually was not in the repair shop or come out of an inspection type situation and something like this had happened. So this one actually piqued my interest just for that factor alone. So up to about six weeks or so before this accident happened, here are the engineering reports on this particular locomotive. So on September 11th, we have an engineer report and it says the water pump will not pick up water and it was repaired by a machinist and approved by the foreman. On September 15th, a report by the engineer, feed water pump does not work, repaired by machinist, approved by the foreman. September 16th, reported by engineer, gauge to water pump doesn't work, clean both water glasses, can't see water, and this was repaired by machinist with notation, no gauge in stock, approved by foreman. So what's interesting about this particular report there was that the fact that there is no gauge in stock, but it doesn't tell us if the locomotive was put back in service, which it should not have been. So anyhow, moving on to September 21st, a report by an engineer, air pumps and water pump not getting enough oil, heading on sheet shows conditions of air compressors good and condition of water pump good, and this is repaired by a machinist and approved by the foreman. So the next report by an engineer isn't until October 13th, and it says weld boat on injector so can put injector on, and this is repaired by a machinist and approved by the foreman. And from the Burnham Engineer House in Denver, Colorado, there are several reports beginning on August 15th of 1952. So on August the 15th, reported by inspector, drain valve to front water pump cylinder leaking, repaired by machinist. On August 24th, report, reported by an inspector, gauge-cock union leaks, no tag on water pump handle, repaired by machinist and approved by foreman. On August 29th, reported by inspector, test out water pump and injector, no water in tank, work done by machinist, approved by foreman. So on August 31st, reported by engineer, water pump doesn't supply boiler when working engine hard. This item signed off, no out-of-line condition found by the foreman. September 5th, reported by inspector, pack nut and our top water glass cock leaking, repaired by inspector, approved by foreman. And there are just two further reports from Min Minturn, Colorado, uh, from July 28th, 1952 and onward. And the first one is August 9th, reported by engineer, lubricator pipe broken at water pump, repaired by machinist, approved by lead man and august the 12th reported by machinist tighten caps on water pump discharge valves repaired by machinist and approved by the foreman so that's the end of the reports on maintenance issues and and reportings uh on this particular 3703 challenger locomotive 
And right here, I should note that in all of the stuff that I've read in the past about these boiler inspections and whatnot, everything on this report was looked into and repaired by some sort of machinist, where in the past, like on the Allegheny 1642 and etc., they were ignored, basically, and the locomotives were allowed to operate and something bad happened, where here, everything was looked into. Okay, so the summary of the accident itself was on October 19th of 1952 at about 11.10 a.m. at Louvier, Colorado. The boiler of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad locomotive 3703 exploded while the locomotive was hauling a freight train at an estimate speed of 15 miles an hour. The engineer, fireman, brakeman, and a trespasser were all killed. And later, the trespasser was found to be a railroad enthusiast just trying to take pictures. And... The surviving film from his camera was actually taken and the photos were later processed. Now, I've, I have not and could not find those photos. So the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad locomotive 3703 was hauling a southbound freight train, which was numbered uh, 63-S, and it departed from Burnham Yards in Denver, Colorado at about 1025 a.m. on October 19th of 1952, and it proceeded without any known unusual incident to a point approaching Louvier, a distance of 19 and a half miles, where at about 11.10 a.m. the boiler of the locomotive exploded while the train was moving at an estimated speed of 15 miles per hour. The train consisted of 31 loaded and 64 empty cars and a caboose, 4241 adjusted tons. And it was also noted that at the time of the explosion, the locomotive was operating on level tangent track. The engineer who operated the Denver and Rio Grande locomotive 3703 on a freight train from Pueblo, Colorado to Denver, Colorado on its last complete trip, arriving at Burnham Engine House at 7.30 p.m. October 17th, stated he had used this locomotive several times in the previous month and that it did not steam very well. However, on the last trip it steamed okay. He had tonnage rating but never had to use the inspirator as the feed water pump kept one half of three quarts, three quarts glass of water in boiler at all times. The engineer stated he had tested the inspirator before starting the trip and found it operated satisfactory. All water level indicating devices were in good condition, were well illuminated and gave uniform readings. There was no smoke or steam in the cab. The throttle stuck open at the top of the hill at Palmer Lake. He finally worked it nearly shut, but it leaked some. He stated he would not have ejected if called to operate the locomotive again after repairs are made to the throttle. Well, a lot of us probably do not know this, but an inspirator has two chambers which are individually adjustable. One chamber with nozzle for suction, which feeds a second cham chamber with nozzle for discharge. The steam supply to each chamber is individually adjustable, although usually tied together on the same handle. Whereas in an injector, it has just a single chamber with a combined suction and delivery nozzle that creates a vacuum and then discharges the jet of water at high velocity. So the fireman on the 3703 on October 17th stated that he was nervous on that date because when he last fired the 3703 in September, it did not steam very well. On that date, the feed water pump supplied the boiler easily as it did on October 17th. On the latter trip, the boiler steamed freely and he noted that his safety valve started to open once just as the steam gauge hand neared the red mark of the dial. He opened the water pump valve wider to prevent this. The feed water pump gauge fluctuated normally with each stroke. He had to work the pump to capacity only once, even when making good time with a full tonnage. The water glasses were clean, well illuminated, and showed uniform readings. He tested all apparatuses before leaving Pueblo and found them functioning properly also. He used a blow-off cock several times. He never noticed any dis discharge from the tangential dryer, and there were no leaks in the firebox, and the, and the boiler did not foam. Three engine house foremen, the fire builder, a machinist, and a hostler, uh, and a hostler helper testified with respect to work performed on the locomotive 3703. It stated that the locomotive and devices functioned normally at the time of departure. The conductor and rear, rear brakeman stated that members of the engine crew appeared normal and in good spirits prior to the accident. So basically, there's no clue that this locomotive was going to do what it was about to do, unlike the previous incidences that I did uh, videos on. So as noted earlier, the locomotive is just simply traveling along, no incidents is going on, and it's going about 15 miles an hour, and at approximately 11.10 a.m., the boiler explodes, 
And when it did, the force of the explosion tore the boiler from the running gear and hurled it and the attached cab forward and slightly to the right. The boiler half turned in the air and alighted on its top nearly parallel with the track and just outside the right rail and plowed forward 35 feet, splintering or breaking off at the ends of 10 ties. The boiler came to a rest approximately 260 feet from the point of explosion, buried 3 to 4 feet in cinders and dirt. It was headed to re in reverse direction to the train movement, with a firebox some 9 feet in the smoke box some 14 feet from the w west rail and leaning 35 degrees from the track axis. Parts of the locomotive itself were scattered in various directions. Pieces of grates were blown over 75 feet from the point of explosion. 200 pound sections of center and sidebars over 100 feet. S fan supports as far as 350 feet. Hot pieces of arch brick were thrown as far as 450 feet to the sides and rear and started fires in adjoining stubble fields which burned over several acres. The front and door, both halves of the fire door, were blown off. Air and water pipes, pieces of jacket and ass fan, sandboxes, part of, headlight, of the headlight case, pieces of reverse gear and arch support and other records were scattered from, from the scene of the explosion to the resting place of the boiler. There were several telephone poles blown over and wires, of course, broken. The cab itself was crushed against the boiler backhead. One air pump and the feed water heater bundle were torn from the front end ring, and safety valves, saturated steam turret, and overhead boiler checks were torn from the boiler itself. The force of the explosion also broke the heavy hinge casting, forming the articulated connection between the front and rear engines of the locomotive, and broke both rear sections of mainframes over the trailing axle. The front engine and engine truck became separated from the rear engine and continued forward for nearly 1,800 feet on a .79 grade before coming to a stop. The front two-thirds of the train remained attached to the tender trailing truck and rear engine and moved forward to a point of more than 200 feet beyond the boiler were coming to a rest. All locomotive and car wheels remained on the rails. Now that's amazing. All of those uh, wheels were on the rails and did not derail, tip over, or anything like that. Where the front end of the tender stood on the track, track fill, small gullies were washed in each side of the embankment by streams of water from a broken connections in inspirator piping and at the front end of the left tank hose. So folks, I'm reading the ICC report uh, verbatim. This is not my English or writing, okay? So bear with me. And here is one very interesting tidbit from this report, and it states that the boiler was not equipped with a low water alarm or fusible plugs. Now, how do you get away with operating in under those conditions? I do not know, especially without a low water alarm, because we've all learned in the past that fusible plugs were not a necessary requirement. But in the least, I had always thought that a low water alarm was required. Now, this is, I may be wrong, but... I, this is the first I've ever heard of this. And what, furthermore, what's really interesting is that the cause of the accident was simply to be, you know, determined that it was caused by an overheated crown sheet due to low water. Now, no duh, we all know that. But nowhere in this report does it state what the actual cause of that was. You know, why was the crown sheet exposed? And I didn't find a, you know, a blame for this, like an, a, an injector malfunctioning or anything like that. So I don't think they actually found the real cause of, these, of this accident and the locomotive just did what it did, which the boiler exploded. So the end of this story is rather anticlimactic and, you know, I have to apologize for that. But this is just one of those freak accidents, if you ask me, that maybe the, you know, the injectors or the inspirators or what have you just got clogged by some foul water all of a sudden and it exposed the, the uh, crown sheet. That's the only guess I can come up with. If you all have a better theory on this, let me know in the comments below because we, I think we would all like to hear it. But that's my guess is the locomotive got some foul water from the tender that, that blocked the injectors or what have you and then the locomotive uh, boiler exploded. Because this stuff happens really quickly. It's not like you've got warning or anything like that. And with that, I'll wrap up the video, and I shall thank you for watching the video. Uh, if you enjoyed today's content, please leave a like. And also, if you've not subscribed, uh, please hit the subscribe button, as both features help the channel grow immensely. And once again, don't forget about the super thanks. Any contribution toward the channel's effort is greatly appreciated. And if you don't want to do it that way, you can visit our print shop at Nickel Plate Limited on Etsy.com and support the channel in that way. And we thank you very much.